What if I told you that the narrative in which we discover in Romans chapter four and what was going on in the early church hasn't changed for us even today in the 21st century? For those of us who might feel an entitlement, we might feel that we deserve the Lord's righteousness, possibly live a life that is self-righteous. And for those of us possibly here that don't feel worthy, that are striving and missing out on the promise that God gave us ages ago. Let it not be the case with us this morning that we miss out on the righteousness that God has for us today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Graham Collett. I am the pastor to families here at Asbury. Uh, some of you have been wondering, where is that guy? What happened to him? Is he gone? Is he no longer here with us? Uh, no, that is not the case. You're stuck with me for a little while, you know? And so I've been busy. My position changed a little bit here at Asbury. I've been overseeing our family ministry, which is our kids and student ministry combined and kind of providing leadership for that area of the church. And because of that, I've gotten to be a part of some fun stuff. So here's a couple of pictures of what I've been up to. So Pastor Andrew shared this photo while I was at Overlap Camp. I got to preach to our middle school and high school students. And uh, yes, I am wearing a cat t-shirt. I am in my prime right there uh, with a cat shirt. Uh, here's another picture of our VBS. We had hundreds of kids and students and volunteers, a part of our VBS. I got slimed. It was awesome. It smelled like strawberry just washing over me, just a presence of the Lord. And then here's another picture uh, from Glow Night. Yes, those are light up shoes. They're Amazon special. They're 30 bucks online if you're looking where to find those. Uh, and then immediately after that, I got to go down to the student ministry and to serve Holy Communion to our students with my boys and, and create a just sweet memory and moment with them uh, down with our students. So it's been fun. I've had a blast. And uh, here's a picture of our team. We're all wearing cat shirts. Uh, I made them all wear cat shirts to our first staff meeting together. It was awesome. Uh, they took them off immediately after, okay? Uh, so if you're a guest with this morning and you're wearing a cat shirt, come find me and I'll take you to lunch this week. We'll be best friends, okay? And if you're not, come back next week and wear a cat shirt. You know, we want you to be involved at our church here at Asbury and we hope to become a part of your family. But all that joking aside, Asbury is a Bible reading church and we've been reading through, studying, and wrestling through the book of Romans. And so, as we prepare our hearts for what the Lord has for us this morning, let us take a moment and have a prayer. So Lord, we ask that you would come like a rushing wind, that you would truly fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would shape us, that you would mold us, or that you would transform us and renew us to know this promise that your righteousness is here before us now, even in these moments. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to Romans chapter four is where we're gonna be spending our time this morning and a quick recap. So Romans chapter one, Paul spends some time illustrating about what's going on out in the world, the brokenness, the sin, the destruction, the darkness of heart, the futile thoughts of the people outside of the children of God. And then Paul kind of does this switcheroo and he has the Jewish Christians essentially to turn the mirror back on to themselves to look and see that possibly in Romans 2 that their lives aren't much different than what's going on in the world. And Pastor Andrew called us to a place of repentance last week where we came forward and brought the things that we've been struggling with and the tensions that we needed to bring before the Lord and repenting before his throne. And then Paul begins to shift gears in Romans 3 and he wants the reader to understand that 
we're on level playing field now. That the Jewish Christian and the Gentile believer are now equal. There's equal space under the banner of Christ. And then he pushes in in Romans 4 to defend with multiple arguments so that the Gentiles feel that they have a place in the kingdom. So pick up with me, Romans chapter four, verse one. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he was something to boast about, but not before God. You see, most of us, if we've grown up in the church, we know the story about Abraham in Genesis 12 in which God calls him to a land in which he does not know, and he follows, which that could be enough in itself to boast about. But Paul says, no, 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 no. He can boast about some good things that he has done. However, there's a difference between the righteousness of God and the works of man. You see, he goes on to say in verse three, for what does the scriptures say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, if you've been a part of the Bible studies here that Pastor Andrew leads us through, when we see moments in which scripture points to another text, Andrew's called them hyperlinks for us. So it's almost like if we click on what is taking place, the Apostle Paul wants us to look and see what was going on in this verse. Why was Abraham counted as righteous? Because he believed. So in Genesis chapter 15, we have this beautiful, intimate conversation between Abraham and God in which at this point, Abraham's been told that he's gonna be the father to the nations, that out of his lineage, that his descendants would bring bless blessings. However, the challenge is, he doesn't have any kids yet. And so he has this kind of vulnerable moment where he's kind of arguing with God, and God brings him outside, and he says, look at the stars, Abraham. Can you number all those? He says, all the stars out here will be the descendants through your line. And then we find this verse that Paul pointed us to. That Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. Back to Romans 4. Verse 4. Now to the one who works his wages are not counted as a gift, but as is his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. You see what Paul wants the early church to understand is that it wasn't about what Abraham was able to do, but it was exactly the point that he believed. That was it. That was all that mattered. It wasn't about the work that he would step into the call that God had placed on his life, but it was the fact that he believed that God would do what God said he would do. And so this is argument number one in which Paul lays out before the Jewish Christians, he says, look, it's not about your works. Look at Abraham. It wasn't about his works. And we follow on in argument two, verse nine, it says this, is the blessing then only from the circum for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteous. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but it was before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of his righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. And here's what Paul wants us to see. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believed without being circumcised so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well. 
You see, Paul wants the reader to see it's not about the works. It's not about this covenant in which God had placed on Abraham's family in Genesis 17. He says, look, what came first? Abraham being righteous or the circumcision covenant? And he's like, that came later. It came after that Abraham was counted as righteous. It came later in Genesis 17. And so he says, look, you can't even say that because I'm a, a descendant of Abraham and we've participated in this covenant. No, Paul wants them to understand that that's not important either at this point. He goes on with a third argument. He says, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir to the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it was the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgressions. You see, it's almost as if Abraham wants the Jewish Christians to understand, I'm sorry, it's not about who you're a descendant of. It's not about the fact that the law has come. That's the third argument, that, that the, the law was received by the people of God and they've been following these commands of God. It's not about that either. Abraham was before the law. So he wants them to see that the righteousness is due to Abraham and it's available to all who believe, not just the Jewish people of faith. And I don't know about you, but there's times I feel entitled to God's righteousness. There's times that I feel due that I should be receiving the blessings of God. That I've been a Christian for this many years, or I've been following after the Lord, I've been serving biscuits and gravy at men's breakfast for 15 years. So the Lord better be paying out his righteousness to me. And we joke that sometimes we're sitting in the pew and next thing you know, like somebody's in our seat and what do we say? You're in my pew. And it's like, no, sorry. That's not how the righteousness works. In fact, I remember a time when I was in college, I was a crazy college student. Um, people that looked probably on the outside of my life, they were like, what is this guy up to? And so I had this crazy conversion moment where I was like all in for Jesus and, and I felt like the Lord was calling me to Northern Uganda. And so I kind of leaned into this. Well, I ended up dropping out of school and moving over to Northern Uganda and mobilizing people to go and do mission work in a war zone area. And I come back and I'm preparing the next team and all I have is four people signed up, myself and three others. And I remember sitting in a parking stall right outside the dorms at OSU. And I remember just, come on, Lord. Like I've done everything. I've sacrificed all these things so that we could build these relationships with these people in this war-torn area. And I got four people to take this summer. And I remember, if you've ever been there where the Lord just slaps you in the face a little bit, the Holy Spirit was just speaking clearly. Who do you think you are? Well, okay, sorry, sorry, Lord, cross the line here. And as I leaned into that, the Lord spoke. He said, Moses didn't even get to go to the promised land. He saw it. He didn't get to go see it. He didn't get to go to it. And I remember just sitting in the car, weeping and repenting and saying, I'm sorry, Lord, you're right. And so it's almost as if there's this posture even today in the church that we're entitled to the righteousness of God, that we deserve it. And Paul wants us to hear that it's not the case. Like it, it is it's not about where you've been, what line you're a part of. It's like, there's something more here that we need to understand. See, there's something about the faith that was counted to him as righteousness. Paul goes on to write this, chapter four, verse 16. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his offspring. 
Not only the adherent of the law, but also the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So I want you to know that the faith that we place in the Lord, like even when there is void, the same God that created, like that God is available to all of us. In hope, this is Abraham, in hope he believed against hope. Even when there was nothing to hold on to, when God gave him this promise that he would be the father of nations, yet no children. There was a hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. So as I mentioned earlier, there's these hyperlinks. And in verse three, in verse nine, and in verse 22, it's almost as if the apostle Paul left breadcrumbs strategically for us to see. It's important for us to know where we've been so that we can actually understand the argument in which God is offering his righteousness to anyone who would receive and believe in Jesus. And so we go back in time. Genesis 12, Abraham is called to go. And this is unpopular opinion, okay? I, I realize I may get an email for this because Abraham, he's a man of God, but he's also imperfect too, like you and I. You see, Abraham is called to go. He, he's called to leave his family, to leave the land, and he takes Lot, number one, in chapter 12. And then as he goes into the land of Egypt, he tells his wife, he's like, let's tell them you're my sister. Because if we tell them you're my sister, they won't kill me and take you for themselves. And so I wonder what was going on in Abraham's heart, in his life. It was almost this like striving to get a hold of the thing that God has called him to. And he's trying to take control of it himself. Do we ever find ourselves in that place? That striving of like, well, God, I, I see what you're doing, but it's not happening right now. And that isn't where it stops right there, right? So in Genesis 15, he's told, look, look, it's counted to you as righteousness because you believe. But then what happens next? In Genesis 16, his wife, Sarah, is unable to have a child. And so... She says, Abram, maybe our line's supposed to come through my servant, Hagar. And it's like, what are you doing? Abraham, like, you're missing it, man. Like, it's right here. God's called you. He's already told you, like. And then in Genesis 17, he laughs at God. And in Genesis 20, there's this, he's before Abimelech and he's like, hey, this is my sister, he does it again. He tells people that his wife is his sister and, and the Lord intervenes on each of these situations because the Lord is like, the Lord has a plan. The Lord is doing something and he just needs Abraham to trust in that posture of where God's gonna do. And it's interesting to read what Paul writes about. Following, he says this. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Saren's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promised God of God, but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God. I wanna stop there for a second because I wonder I wonder how many of us have this same striving spirit within us that we've got to perform in some capacity to, to receive this righteousness that God has placed already before us. You see, it says that Abraham grew in faith. 
It's almost as if in Genesis 12, he wasn't quite ready to be the father of nations. And it took this process from Genesis 12 to Genesis 22 in which he would receive and truly understand and trust the promise of God. For it is in Genesis 22 that he has his one son, Isaac. And the Lord says, take him up here to sacrifice him. And there's no wavering that takes place with Abraham. There's nothing. He grabs his son, he grabs the sticks, he grabs his men and he goes. And it's almost as if like all that striving, it's like he finally realized that it wasn't about what he could do to be a part of what God's plan was taking place in front of him. You see in verse 22, this is why his faith was counted to him as righteous. The narrative in which we might find ourselves this morning, we might feel as though we deserve it, that we deserve the righteousness of God, that, that we're entitled to it, that we've been living a life following the Lord. And so, of course, like, why wouldn't the Lord be upon me or be seen through me? Whereas some of us may feel this constant striving that we may not feel worthy or able to even be able to be recipients of it like the Gentiles did. And I know for myself, like that's the side where I am camped most of my time because I don't feel worth it. I don't feel that I'm enough, that if I just do this or that, that the Lord would make me righteous, that I would be considered a righteous man of faith, and the Lord speaks to the core in that. It's not about what I feel. It's about what he has already done. I just have to recognize it. You see, here's a picture of Jatan and I on our wedding day. This is my favorite picture that the photographer got because I'm a weeping mess up there. I'm just like bawling my eyes out, which is a, not a new thing for me, right? There's Kleenex right there. And so it's like, I'm just, just overwhelmed. It was a beautiful January morning. Snow had come and sprinkled the earth right before our wedding. And so Chetan had to tiptoe out through, the, out through the chapel and come in through the back door. I hadn't seen her and the doors fling open. And I'm just in awe. I'm in awe of what God has been so gracious to, to give me for the rest of my life, that he would give me this beautiful woman who loves him, who loves his people. And so my pastor leans over, he's like, here's my handkerchief, buddy, you're gonna need it. And I'm just like bawling my eyes out. You see, I didn't always live the perfect life. I wasn't always walking in step with the Lord. I was a part of unhealthy relationships. And so I started dating this beautiful Christian girl at OSU. And she's wearing this ring on her hand. And I'm like, what is that all about? It's like, you're not married. Like what's happening here? So it's, it's a purity ring. And that became a place of tension and conflict internally within me in which I did not feel worthy that God would give me this beautiful woman to be in a relationship with knowing that I had not always made the right decision. It's like, why, what? I'm not worthy of this, Lord. And so we're down in Dallas, we're visiting her parents and her and I are having breakfast at Panera. I'm sitting there with my delicious cinnamon crunch bagel and my coffee and I'm sitting there and she's like, hey, I, I have something for you. And she pulls out this box, this box. She slides it over to me and I open it up. And there's a ring. And she says, I want you to know that I see you 
as holy and righteous just as the Lord sees you today when he forgave you. And it's like, that's what Paul wants the early church to understand, that it's not about who we've been and the lifestyle that we've lived, that we deserve the righteousness of God, that we should just automatically be recipients of it. Or for those of us who never feel worthy, that never actually feel like we're enough, God says, no, no, it's not about you, buddy. It is all about what I did. And he does this in Romans chapter three when he says this, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short for the glory of God and are justified by his grace. For it's a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter how I feel this morning, whether I feel that I deserve God's righteousness or not, or I feel unworthy, it is not about that. It is that Jesus Christ was crucified and rose again to set us all free. And he says, all you have to do is believe. The promise is there. See, Paul is brilliant. These are the closing words of Romans chapter four. But the words, it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. You see, Paul is leveling the ground for each of us in this room. That the narrative that maybe we've been telling ourselves, the narrative that maybe we believed about who we are and God says, no, no, it doesn't matter. Maybe this is your moment this morning. Maybe you've been a part of the church and you believe that you've got this righteousness of God already upon you, but maybe this is the activation moment that you realize that it's not about what you've done or what you've been a part of or how you've served the Lord or the works that you've done for the kingdom, and it's not about that. Or maybe you've come in here, walked through a divorce, been wrestling through sin, you've made poor decisions, and the Lord says it's just as much for you as the other person. That the grace of God in Jesus Christ, the righteousness that he places on his people, it's nothing you can do, it's for you. And so wherever you are this morning, may you hold fast to the promise in which the Lord gave Abraham ages ago, that you are a child of God, that God has created you for more. And all you have to do is receive the righteousness that he has for you today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.